recording now. Okay, so uh, welcome to Doctrine of the Church. Last uh, week, we talked about um, every member ministry, and I argued that um, whatever you think, you might have some debates about particularly using the word ministry itself, but the idea that every single church member is to be, has a function to play in building up the church is a biblical one. So recently we've talked about every believer has giftings of the Holy Spirit and every believer has a function to build up the church. Um, We've talked about a priesthood of all believers and a prophethood and kingship as well of all believers that that category prophet, priest, and king applies in some way to all believers. Um, So you may be wondering, um, well, if that's the case, if we have a priesthood of all believers, do we need any hierarchical authority structures at all? Um, Should we have um, uh, any sorts of uh, special offices in the church? Or should we just um, have every believer um, individually coming together um, and, uh, you know, sharing with each other what we know, but not having any uh, distinguishing of certain, certain believers as having more authority than others? Some groups like the Quakers uh, do take an interpretation somewhat like that and practice uh, their their uh, church polity accordingly. Um, so I want us to think today about the actual biblical case for uh, church officers, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what ordination means. The first point we could make uh, just in starting is that uh, Jesus appointed apostles. So it seems that uh, although there is this radical new gifting of the spirit to everybody under the new covenant, and that is a change from uh, how it had been previously, um, this change does not mean that there is not going to, that there is no longer um, any authority structure in the church. Jesus himself left us with an authority structure um, of uh uh, 12 apostles, well, 11 after Judas had left, but then they supplemented a, a 12th one by casting lot, a, a lot for, the defi- for, the, for God's decision there. Um, and so right off the bat, we should observe that uh, the, the model that Jesus has left his church is in fact for us to be um, blessed through the gift of certain authoritative um, individuals uh, who, of course, are subordinate to scripture and their authority, are subordinate to the message of the gospel. Um, we may have said a little bit about that when, uh, uh, it, when we talked about the office of apostle, and we'll come back to it again when we talk about doctrine of scripture. Um, but there are humans who bear special authority. Um, and then the question might be, well, what, we don't have, if we don't have apostles anymore, well, what happens then? So at this point, I want to turn us to our, uh, some of our texts. Um, the first thing I want to say in opening is this text from 1 Timothy 2.5, which I, I, I'm, I'm bringing in as a limit or a control on our theology of church office. So 1 Timothy 2.5, for there is one God and one mediator between God and humans, the human Jesus Christ. So this passage is important because what it highlights is that Jesus is the fulfillment uh, of actually all the Old Testament offices. And because of that, there are certain features of Old Testament offices which only Jesus holds, and Jesus still holds in the church, and that's just his function. The one that's really highlighted here is mediator. Uh, Mediator would be somebody who goes between two individuals. Uh, Jesus is the, the, the one between us and God, the one who allows us access to God. And, uh, Paul here puts this doctrine right next to monotheism as saying we got one God and we got one mediator. Um, And what that means is that we are going to have to be careful as we think about what it means uh, for us to hold church, for um, people to hold uh, church office. We're going to have to be careful to not conceive of them as mediators, which might be easy to do. If we have a huge emphasis on, Um, the importance of the preaching of the word and the administration of sacraments as ways in which we have access to God. And, and, you know, there are, we do think about them in ways that are like that. Uh, 
then we could be tempted to think that the pastor uh, or the elders who make that happen uh, are are go-betweens, that we only come to God through them. But that would be mistaken. That would be to miss the fact that when it comes to mediatorship, all of us are equal before God. We, we, we all have access through Jesus Christ, and none, no one of us has access to God in this mediatorial way through another uh, human being other than Jesus Christ. So that's a, a overall global control for us to think about. But it has important consequences because, of course, people like Moses or prophets or priests did function like mediators in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, uh, in, in some respects. And so uh, those aspects of those um, Old Covenant offices are not things that we should bring over into the New Covenant. Um, now, that said, as I mentioned before, Christ ordained apostles. And these other texts here from Paul show that even after the apostles left, they still uh, left us with an authoritative structure for the church. So these are um, statements Paul makes in his letters to Timothy and Titus. Uh, we kind of uh, can think of these as at the end of Paul's life, which is how we tend to think of them, and um, him preparing the way um, for um, his, uh, when he's going to, going to die and the whole, that whole first generation of apostles is going to die and things are going to be carried on. So 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, And what you have heard from me through many witnesses, commit these things to worthy men such as are also capable of teaching others. Titus 1.5, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put in order what is left over, and so that you might appoint elders in every church as I directed you. Titus 1.9, we must hold fast to the faithful word according to the teaching, in order that he may be able to exhort, or in order that he may be able to exhort with healthy teaching and to refute those who speak against it. We're talking about qualifications of, of elders here. Um, so in all these passages, in the first passage, Paul is speaking directly to Timothy, and in the second, he's, uh, second two, he's talking about appointing elders. Uh, we get the same general picture here. Paul is concerned um, about the... Uh, maintain maintenance of, of, of what we could say faithfulness to doctrine or faithfulness to teaching because Jesus is this ultimate revelation of God revelation is to a certain extent fin finished the canon is closed at least until Jesus returns we're going to receive no new revelation of God and therefore this first generation of apostles does something that's not repeatable they convey the word about Christ in this inspired inerrant fashion and the doctrine of the church is, is complete with that first generation of apostles, at least uh, in principle. There may be outworkings that the church still has to come to understand, but it's, uh, it's um, uh, stored up in sacred scripture as a, a complete a, um, record of who, of who God is. We, can, and this, we mentioned this is one of the aspects of the Catholicity of the church, a completeness, a wholeness to the church's doctrine. And that doctrine is now handed on by Paul to Titus and Timothy and, and to these elders they're going to appoint. And one of the tasks for them is going to be being faithful to this teaching, holding on to it. It's not primarily their job to come up with new ideas. Um, it's, it's not their job to uh, innovate or push things farther. It's their job to hold on to what they've been given. Um, and it's also important, not just that they understand it, but that they are also capable of teaching others. So um, it's import the important role they play is um, carrying on uh, this task of helping the community understand the word that God has given. Again, we want to nuance this. Like we said in the last talk, uh, there is a kind of uh, respect for a teacher that is inappropriate in the church because Christ is our one teacher. And yet, nevertheless, um, there are certain individuals who have been spe specially gifted with, with teaching and submission to Scripture. Why is this especially important? Well, we see it here at the end of Titus, to refute those who speak against it. And we see this all throughout Paul's letters and other letters of the New Testament, the danger of false teaching. Um, which was already a huge danger um, at that point and would be going forward in the history of the church because there's this threat of the corruption of the gospel by false teachers coming in outside, maintaining, uh, maintaining 
faithfulness to doctrine, faithfulness to the teaching received from Christ and his apostles is a really big deal. And it definitely seems to, in these three passages at least, it definitely seems to weigh pretty heavily as one of the reasons why you had have ordained office bearers, at least the office of elder, is that um, we need uh, a group of people who are going to be holding us faithful to this teaching, faithful to doctrine, and who are going to teach it themselves. Um, Okay, let's uh, keep looking here at uh, um, another another angle. So that's one angle on that, that because we need faithfulness to teaching, certain people in the church are particularly entrusted with maintaining faithful teaching. Um, another way of looking at it is going back to the prophet, priest, and king model I mentioned before. And although I, sh I showed you evidence from the New Testament the other day that prophet, priest, and king apply to every believer, and so we might think we're done at that point. But actually, it's a little more complicated because the offices of prophet, priest, and king also have applications um, to ordained office in the church. So there are ways in which those offices apply to every believer, but then there are also special ways in which they apply to offices in, in the church. For instance, 1 Timothy 6.11, where Paul addresses Timothy, but you, O man of God, it's an interesting title, um, I, mean, I don't know if you've ever thought about it, man of God. What does that mean? Does that just mean you're a Christian? Well, um, I, uh, I mean, hopefully we're, we are all people who are faithful to God, but this man of God title has specific resonances from the Old Testament. It is a prophetic title. Uh, we especially think of Elijah and Elisha and the, that cycle of narratives. Uh, when we think of this phrase, man of God, it's kind of the default phrase that people use for Elijah and Elisha uh, when they refer to them. They are men of God. Um, and so here, as I understand it, Paul is understanding Timothy's calling. Um, we can talk about what that is, and uh, we'll get to that, but it's certainly some kind of ordained office in the church. He's talking about Timothy's calling as analogous to a prophet in some way. So there are aspects of the prophetic office that apply to um, ordained office. Uh, and let me. This is an Old Testament passage, but a very important one, Nehemiah 8. I'll just read it to you here. Then Ezra the priest brought the law, law before the assembly, men and women, and all who could understand what they heard, on the first day of the seventh month. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform, which they had made for the purpose. When he opened the book, all the people stood, and they read from the book of the law of God, interpreting it and giving insight, and those in the assembly understood. That last verse is the Levites who help Ezra in this task. Um. So this scene might seem very familiar to you. I don't know if, you're, if you've never looked at this text before, if you're surprised that so much of what we do on Sunday is right here in Nehemiah. Um, you have Ezra, um, a priest, but also a scribe, someone who spent a long time studying the law of God. Um, he stands before the assembly. Um, all the people are gathered together, men and women, and all who could understand what they heard. By the way, that's an interesting phrase, all who could understand what they heard, that emphasis on understanding there. That'll be important for later topics. You know, so go ahead. It's a surprise tool that will help us later, as the meme says. Just note that, file that away, that all men, women, and all who could understand are present there. Okay. Um, then as then they read the law. Well, first of all, Ezra stands on a wooden plat like the a wooden platform they construct for the purpose. Um, so he's, he's kind of raised up, so he's visible and everybody can hear him. Um, there's a, you know, there's a, 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 a pulpit. I mean, maybe the first pulpit ever constructed right here. Um, he opens the book. Everybody stands up for the reading of God's word. That, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe uh, um, we should do that too. Um, but uh, everybody stands up for the reading of God's word. They read from the book of the law of God, and then he interprets it and gives an insight. Or uh, the Levites help him here, so maybe this is more of a group sermon. That might be a little different. Okay, we, we'll, we'll talk about this when we come to, to preaching in the word of God for the more details, but just notice how striking this aspect of the office of priesthood is to what a preacher does or a teacher does in our church today. It's not a coincidence. Um, we tend to think of priests as offering sacrifices. That's kind of our stereotypical priestly activity in our mind. And when we go along that frame of reference, we might think that that's not something that maps onto our pastors today. In fact, we don't call our pastors priests. Um, 
something we may come back to later for the, the reasons for that. Um, but probably one of the reasons is that the reformers were trying to escape the idea that the Lord's Supper is a re-sacrifice of Christ. Um, Jesus is the one who is the great high priest, that title of high priest who has that special role in offering an atoning sacrifice is not something that is recapitulated in our ordained office bearers. That's something only Jesus does. So when we think of the sacrificial aspect of the priesthood, we're, we're mostly thinking of, um, at least if it's atoning sacrifice, we're mostly thinking about something that's fulfilled in Christ and not part of our understanding of our officers. But there's a whole nother side to the priests and the Levites, which is that they are entrusted with this book of the law of God um, probably, you know, books were expensive, scrolls were expensive, and probably the, the community of, of scribes and priests uh, connected to the temple was the primary locus for preserving, copying, um, and, carrying, and carrying forward the word of God. Uh, and the temple storehouses were probably where the best manuscripts were kept. Most people probably didn't have a Bible in their home. That would not have been financially possible. Even if they even if they could read, um, and so a big part of the priesthood in the Old Testament, people don't always realize this, is teaching, teaching the law. Prophets do it too, um, but priests teach the law. And so the new when in the New Testament we see people who are gifted to teach, um, well, that there's a certain aspect of that priestly calling which maps onto our ordained office bearers. Um, and finally, even the king one. Um, again, I showed you proof texts that all believers who are in Christ are seated with him in heavenly places and uh, rule with him. Um, but we also have, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who toil in the word and teaching. There is an authority structure here. Um, and, and, the, and to the extent that elders... Uh, carry out that, uh, their use of that authority in a responsible way and reflect Christ's servant leadership, um, there is a special way in, in which um, this kingly role is uh, embodied in our ordained officers. So that's just to give you an idea of the balance we need to have. We don't want to so um, map these roles onto our ordained officers that we think of them as prophet, priests, and kings, and those terms have nothing to do with us. Um, at the same time, um, we don't want to so emphasize prophethood, uh, priesthood, and, and kingship of old believers that we miss the uh, special gifts God's given certain members of our community, which are to be exercised in an authoritative way. Um, it's important to have a uh, nuanced enough understanding of the church to realize that there are a role for both of these. Okay. Yeah, as we'll see, how exactly you work out the balance is tricky, and different Christian denominations have understood that differently. Um, but we need to have both of those in our understanding of the doctrine of the church. And then finally, kind of like just a third angle on it. Um, why is it that we need um, ordained office bearers? Why can't we just be all you know all of us christians come together we need to decide something we vote on it as a body why do we need a special um, set of christians who have authoritative powers um one biblical principle that helps us understand this is not everybody is equally wise you know proverbs thirteen twenty: the one who walks with the wise will become wise but the friend of fools will become evil that's just a sampling proverbs as a whole emphasizes um that there are certain wise people in this world and there are fools. The fools tend to talk more, but you should listen. When the wise people do talk, you really need to listen to them. Uh, and this applies too uh, to Christians. Now we've all been given the spirit. And so there's a way in which we should um, in humbleness and dependence upon the spirit, we should expect every believer in Christ to have wisdom from God for us in some degree. Um, we, that's something that, that we should expect. And that's a, a, there's a respect we should have towards the voices of our fellow believers in Christ, no matter how much we might disagree with them on other topics and even maybe get angry with them about it. Sometimes there's a respect we need to have towards their voice, um, because they have the spirit that said though, not all Christians have come to the same point in their walk with Christ. Not all of them are equally wise. Not all of them are, and some of them are extraordinarily gifted in wisdom. 
And so it's important to recognize that while we're in this world and our sanctification is imperfect, um, some believers will have greater wisdom than others. Uh, and it's appropriate for the church to be listening to those voices and led by those voices. Um, this principle is something that is, I think, preserved by the, uh, by the appointment of special officers who have shown maturity uh, in the Christian life um, and uh, whose uh, leadership we should follow. There's a, and one of the other things you'll notice in the Bible is that there's a general association of this with age. So if you know the story of Rehoboam, I won't read the whole text now, but Rehoboam is Solomon's son. And at the inauguration of his reign, things are a little shaky politically. And the people are interested in renegotiating some of the terms of kingship, if I can put it that way, particularly their taxes. And they come to Rehoboam and kind of make an ultimatum. And Rehoboam has to decide what to do. And he goes to his older advisors, the ones who serve Solomon, say, well, you know, if you um, will lighten the people's tax burden and you give something to them, then they'll love you forever and you'll have a stable political uh, kingdom. And then he goes to his friends that he grew up with, you know, um, is the young men, and he asks them, and they say, no, nah, you got to go hardcore, seize all the power, say, and, you know, tell them that, um, you know, your uh, little thing, your small member is larger than your father's loins, you know, is even like crude, not at all great, a great way to be speaking to them, but they're basically like, you know, in the crudest way possible, explain to them that you are going to use, uh, that you are going to rule them harshly. And it doesn't go well. It leads to a, you know, a political split that ultimately splits apart kingdom, the kingdom of Israel and Judah for hundreds of years. Okay, what's the point of this? Um, often there's the wisdom that comes with age. This is not an absolute principle. Paul's going to tell Timothy, um, don't let anybody... Um, disregard you because of your, your age. So it's not always the case that older people are wiser. It's not always the case that young people are fools. But there's enough of an overlap. There's enough of a principle there for one of our ordained offices to actually be called elders. I mean, we, we okay, we have a special, we, we have kind of like this term has become fossilized as an office, but uh, the term at its base just kind of means old people. And the office of elder grows out of the expectation that um, the that uh, the older men in a community um, are the ones who tend to bear a certain authority, just like in every village in Israel. That um, That is part of, the, okay, we'll get into more of this when we talk about elders specifically, but um, that's just another way into it. This importance that like, we're not yet at the stage um, in redemptive history where we can uh, afford to ignore the fact that uh, certain people need to be, uh, certain institutions need to exist that place wise people and older people into a position of leadership in the church. And I wanted to make kind of an analogy at this point. I've called it a parallel example on the dangers of over-realized eschatology. Um, every now and then you feel, uh, especially as just a pastoral intern, that you need to prove that you've been to seminary and used one of these big words, um, over-realized eschatology, what's that? Well, if eschatology is the study of the final things, you could think of it as the end times. Um, and in some way, the end has already come in Jesus. The New Testament talks about how this, this new age has already come in Jesus. And yet, at the same time, the consummation of that is not fully here sometimes call that the already and the not yet. There's a lot of blessings we receive from Jesus already, but there's a final consummation that's not yet. Well, then that means there's a tricky balance for us. We could overemphasize the fact that in Jesus, uh, the new age is here. And that could lead us into um, uh, various errors, or we could underrealize it. We could underemphasize uh, the fact that this new age is here and expect less than we should of the blessings Jesus has given us. So when you, when we overemphasize it, we call that overrealized eschatology. And I just wanted to take an example from the family. Um, here's a text from Mark three, his mother and his brothers, that's Jesus, mother and brothers came, sorry, it should be came. And while standing outside, they sent for him, calling him. 
a crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, look, your mothers and your brothers are outside seeking you. He answered them, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And looking at those who were seated around him in a circle, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, this one is my brother and sister and mother. Okay. Now, what would you say if I brought up this text and I said, in this text, we see Jesus abolishing the nuclear family. That's a plausible reading of this text, isn't it? You see, God, when he created the world, he made Adam and Eve. He said, be fruitful and multiply. All through the Old Testament, there was this emphasis on families, having children, and, uh, the king- and God's kingdom growing through um, like actually begetting offspring. But when Jesus comes, that physical reality, that's for the past. Now there's this spiritual thing it was pointing to, which is that we're all brothers in, and sisters in God's family. And so we don't need uh, the nuclear family anymore. It, we've received the spiritual reality. We're all done. Well, first of all, that would ignore a lot of New Testament teaching that seems to assume that our biological families still matter. <laughs> and there's a lot of it uh, on your... Uh, in, in fact, the promise, the promise attached to honoring your father and your mother uh, is actually re- repeated and reaffirmed in the New Testament. So what's going on here? Well, the idea that Jesus came to abolish the nuclear family is actually not insane. Um, In fact, Jesus seems to say that in heaven, there will no longer be marriage. Marriage is going to go away. Um, It it points to a spiritual reality, and when we have that reality, we'll no longer need um, the physical thing. But we're not there yet. (laughs) We're not there yet. Um, And so the full realization of this is something that we're looking forward to. If we said... If we try to bring that in now and say, we are just going to get rid of marriage because Jesus has come, um, we would be indulging in overrealized eschatology. Um, At the same point time, though, that end times reality of of marriage pointing to Christ in the church, we could even say the family pointing to Christ in the church, is something we already experience now. We already experience spiritual brother and sisterhood. It's just that we don't have the full consummation of it. Okay, well, that's a whole topic we could talk about more. Um, I realize there's a whole can of worms there because guess what? There's all the details. Um, should Christians pursue a monastic calling? Where certain, if, if certain Christians can do without marriage, does that make them better? Are they closer to heaven? Um, or uh, you know, or, you know, how, how it, um, should we baptize children? Um, we'll come back to that one. Like, um, is there, is there, is that a place of continuity with the Old Testament where Jesus is coming hasn't changed the fact that children in covenant families are still part of the church or, um, has it changed that? Has, has the, 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 the okay. Lots of questions. Um, so I, I partially bring up the point to, to say that these sorts of problems create these kinds of fuzzy territories where we have to really think through things. Um, but I just use this as an example of the case. If we also were to say, I think that we don't need church officers anymore and we don't need an authority structure, uh, and we don't need, um, uh, structures in which we, we submit to authority because Jesus has come and made us whole priests. Uh, that I think would be a parallel example to saying, uh, oh, we don't need marriage anymore. Many of these kinds of earthly realities, uh, are necessary um, still in this new kingdom age, um, and we won't and won't have completely fulfilled their purpose until the new heavens and the new earth. Um, these are just some principles. The principles um, are there as a way of us trying to understand why it makes sense. But of course. The existence of offices is explicitly taught in the New Testament. So I don't want to give the impression that these prudential principles are the only reasons we have for having offices. I just kind of offer them as a way of thinking about it and making sense of them. You know, when we talked about every member ministry last week, I mentioned the concern of T. David Gordon and others that a certain spirit of 
egalitarianism, a spirit of anti-authoritarianism in the world uh, might infect the church. Uh, I argued that like we should we should still hold on to the idea of every member of something like every member ministry, but that that's not a bad concern. Um, authority is not something that is generally celebrated in the world right now, um, and submission to authority even less so. And this is part of the place where we just need to be countercultural in the church. Uh, and we do need to think carefully about what submission to authority looks like because there are versions of authority which are tyrannical and unbiblical, and there are versions of submission which are unbiblical. But at the end of the day, we're saying something that the world is not going to like, which is that it's a huge, huge, huge New Testament theme that we as Christians are to be submissive people, people who submit to authority, and that God has ordained certain authorities um, in the world and in the church to which we are to submit. And uh, at the end of the day, we're going to have to have a certain amount of believing and following God's word, uh, even when it challenges our culture. Okay, all of that's just kind of by way of introduction. This this lecture may have, have to have a part two. <laughs> but um, Let's move on now to actually address the question more directly and talk more about what the Bible has to say directly about church offices. We'll get into what the offices are in, in later classes, but for now, just the, what, what are some of the texts that help us understand what offices are? So the first principle I want to put forward is that ordained officers are a gift from God. Um, 2 Corinthians 3. Now we have such confidence towards God through Christ not that we are sufficient from ourselves to be reckoned anything as from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, who made us sufficient as servants of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. This is an emphasis you find many places with Paul. He has absolute dependence in his ministry on God. It's a, it's a really important emphasis, especially for those of us who have been called to ordained office to bear in mind. Um, of course, I think this passage applies more broadly than just ordained offices. Office, Like, for all of us, our sufficiency comes from God. But especially for those of us who are in authority structures, there might be a, a temptation to think that we are something. Um, and Paul says, you are not something. <laughs> He says, at least from yourself, you are, not you are not to be reckoned everything, right? We are, no, we are not sufficient from ourselves to be reckoned anything. You know, you're not supposed to look at yourself as something. I think Paul also in Galatians seems to think of this as like the flesh. One of the aspects of the flesh is when I try to take these aspects about who I am from myself, my own sufficiency, and uh, I try to say I'm something. In fact, in Galatians, Paul always says those who seemed to be important or those who seem to be prominent, even when he's talking about legitimate authority, he uses that phrase. Um, why? Because there's something deceptive about um, our human authority structures. There's something that can be just deceitful and tempting about it, um, that we try to take our own sufficiency and make it our um, source of confidence. No, it all comes from God. There's this radical dependence upon God here. Paul says his sufficiency is from God, and God is the one who has made us sufficient as servants of the new covenant. Again, we talked about how broad servants is, that servant, servants and service is something all Christians do. It's something we associate with a particular office we would call deacons, but it's also something that applies to all ordained office. Now, the term is, has kind of a broad word. You know, servants or ministers. We could translate it servants or ministers. They come from the same Greek word. So under the new covenant, he has been given this role of service and the sufficiency comes from God. Another text we could quote is Romans 12, six to eight, but we have different gifts according to the grace of the one who gave to us. If prophecy in the measure of faith, if serving in serving, the one who, again, that's that serving word, the one who teaches in teaching, the one who exhorts in exhortation, the one who shares his goods in simplicity, the one who rules in diligence, the one who shows mercy in cheerfulness. So I just picked this one. We've been through several of these listing, lists of the gifts, and we've always seen ordained office or at least word gifts like prophecy um, included in those lists as gifts of God. 
It's also a good way, um, chance to just remind us again that all the gifts are gifts from God. It's not just ordained ministers who are a gift from God, but every Christian is a gift from God in their particular calling. So all I'm, all I, I think that, you know, all we're really doing here is instantiating that, that general principle uh, and applying it to the specific case of officers. And again, I don't want to caught up, get caught up in the idea that just so elevates officers that we miss the truth of this for all of us. But officers have their gifts as gifts from God. It's not primarily something that just comes from themselves. It is a gift. Um, and, you know, here we see teaching as well as other things which aren't necessarily ordained office, like the one who shares his goods. I mean, that's a very concrete gift, like he's rich. Um, but it's not just about being rich. There's a certain gifting in being able to give with simplicity, um, which means for uh, Judaism in the time of Paul, it means giving with a whole heart, a complete heart, giving generously, not giving out of uh, divided motives or a divided heart. So this applies more broadly than just ordained office, but it does apply to ordained office. So ordained officers are a gift from God. Um, and by the way, I'll just say, like, let's, what is the one application of this that might be most countercultural? Uh, ordained officers are not your elected officials. We'll talk about election later, but it's not as if you're supposed to be like, well, I, I need to be my policy desires to be represented. And so I'm going to choose an elected officer um, uh, to be like, you know, my man in the church. Um, again, we'll talk about election and the importance of election, um, but it's not primarily us as a church, as human beings who are saying, we think it would be a great idea for this, ele this officer to have a position of leadership. Um, Primarily, we as a church should be seeking to discern a gifting God has given. It placed certain demandments on us not to go into something like nominating or electing an elder or a deacon with a spirit of what do I think is wise, but with the spirit of God help me see how you may have gifted individuals in the church. So that's an important first principle. Ordained officers are a gift from God. Next, I want to talk about the laying on of hands. And I don't know, this might be all we have time for today um, before we get to other things. Not only are certain individuals given a special gifting by God, but when the church recognizes that gifting, we ordain them. We have a, a service where we do something we call ordination. One component of that service is a practice. <clears throat> you may have seen it before, where all the other elders gather around them and place their hands upon them. We call it the laying on of hands. So I want to start by tracing some of the Old Testament background because I will say laying on of hands, like, like many things in the Bible, we will find references to it in the New Testament, but they don't always stop and say, okay, let me explicitly explain the ritual significance of what we're doing. We have to kind of go back and understand some of its place in the Old Testament. So I think... The place, the place that stands out to me the most as an Old Testament background for laying on of hands is Numbers 8, 9 through 19. And it refers to um, the dedication of the Levites. Um, so the Levites, um, this is a tribe, one of the 12 tribes. Within the Levites, you have Aaron and his sons who are priests. So this subset of the Levites are priests, but the Levites more generally um, assist, with the, uh, assist in the tabernacle and later in the temple, um, with the ministry of uh, the tabernacle and temple, with the sacrifices, with all of, and with teaching the law. So they they are we're, they're, we're kind, they're kind of like the penumbra around the office of the priesthood. In fact, Levites are you know you could think of them as like a a a, a second order of the priesthood or something like that. The lines are, are of how they're understood are a little blurry, um, although they're a very well defined different group of people. All that is background. Here's what Numbers 8 has to say. You shall bring near the Levites before the tent of meeting and assemble the whole congregation of the children of Israel. You shall bring near the Levites before the Lord and the children of Israel um, shall lay their hands on the Levites. And Aaron shall dedicate the Levites as a dedication offering before the Lord from the children of Israel that they may be to work the work of the Lord. Now the Levites shall lay their hands on the head of the bulls and you shall offer one as a, as a sin offering, 
and one a whole burnt offering to the Lord to atone for the Levites. And you shall make the Levites stand before Aaron and his sons and dedicate them as a dedication offering before the Lord. And you shall separate the Levites from the midst of the children of Israel and the Levites shall belong to me. After this, the Levites shall go in to work in the tent of meeting and you shall purify them and dedicate them as a dedication offering. For they are wholly gifted to me from among the children of Israel in the place of all who open the womb, all the firstborn of the children of Israel, I have taken them for myself. For every firstborn among the children of Israel belongs to me, human and animal. When I struck every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated them to myself. So I took the Levites in place of every firstborn among the children of Israel. I gave the Levites as gifted to Aaron and to his sons from the midst of the children of Israel to work the work for the children of Israel in the tent of meeting and to atone for the children of Israel, that there may be no plague among the children of Israel when the children of Israel come near to the sanctuary. Okay, so now uh, we have to have a bit of a crash course here in the ritual significance of laying out of hands within the context of the law of Moses. And I think this will help illuminate some of the importance of the ritual. I will say, Laying on of hands is something that uh, there perhaps is some debate about, but I think there's at least a general consensus um, around its meaning. So laying on of hands is not common with human beings. It's not something we see a lot. Instead, we find laying on of hands a lot with animals. Let me just point you to another text. This is um, the sacrifice in the case of unintentional sin. And the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull, before the Lord, and the bull shall be slaughtered before the Lord. Um, we'll come back to that text. But many, many other sacrifices, you will see a component of the sacrifice where the, uh, especially if it's a bull or, or an animal or a four-legged animal like that, where the uh, person who is giving the sacrifice, at, like the regular ordinary Israelite who has brought the sacrifice to the temple, places their hands upon, lays their hands upon the, the sacrifice. Um, what is the ritual? <clears throat> what is the ritual significance of that? Well, um, uh, Jacob Milgram, author of uh, the the um, premier commentary on Leviticus, uh, would say that what it does is it identifies um, the offering with the uh, person who offers it. It's them, um, uh, uh, you know putting forward the offering as their own. And we could also say that there's something a little substitutionary about it, that the offering represents the person who is, who is offering the sacrifice in some way. Um, and that's an important background for, say, doctrine of atonement, but uh, it's not limited to doctrine of atonement. So what's happening, uh, and, and, but, and so the, basically the offer is saying, this property belongs to me, um, and on my behalf, I am giving it, transferring it over to this, to God. Um, and so through this action, the offering tr is transferred from the domain of uh, the ownership of uh, the individual and then kind of transferred to God's ownership, given over to God. Okay. Just keep that hypothesis in mind and think about how it works in this case. What are we saying with the Levites? Well, the Levites are um, being offered like a sacrifice. They are an offering um, from the people to God. The Levites are being dedicated. They're being consecrated. You know, when we use the word holy, what's the basic meaning of holy? It means set apart um, to this um, uh, domain of holiness, dedication to God. Um, and so the Levites are being separated as dedicated to God. Not only that, but the Levites have a representative function. There's a sense in which they represent the people of Israel. Um, so um, there are layers to this. First of all, firstborn children have a representative function. Uh, in, when you have the uh, death of the firstborn in Egypt, um, for the sins of the whole people of Egypt, their firstborn are killed. And in the same uh, events, the firstborn of Israel become holy to God. So in some sense, firstborn children have this representative function of the whole people. 
But now um, the Levites themselves are understood as kind of the uh, firstborn of Israel. He says, they're wholly gifted to me among the children of Israel in place of all who opened the womb. Um, so in place of um, the holiness of every firstborn Israelite, the Levites stand as the ones who actually kind of fulfill that obligation by being especially dedicated to God. So there's this representative function. Um, and notice again the, con the theme of gifting, an important theme in the New Testament, right? That the Levites are a gift. They're a gift to God from the people, but they're also a gift from the people to God. Verse 19, I gave, God speaking, I gave the Levites as gifted to Aaron and to his sons from the midst of the children of Israel. And the final component we could see is the Levites are set apart to do a very particular work. The work of the, the um, working for the children of Israel. So they not only represent the whole people, but they work for the people in the tent of meeting. And that work is atoning. Okay, so we already said that that's part of where we're going to have to see discontinuity with the New Testament. I don't, we don't understand the role of our ordained officers as actually atoning for us because Christ has done that. And so that aspect of the Levitical office of the priesthood is fulfilled in Christ. Um, however, many other aspects of this are strikingly reminiscent of the doctrine of ordained office in the New Testament. The fact that the Levites are this special gift, um, from the people, but from God to the people, um, that they have a special work or service um, that they uh, that they practice associated with the temple. Again, temple is fulfilled in New Testament worship, part of which is every believer, but part of which is also what specifically happens on the Sabbath day. We'll talk about this in a later talk. Um, uh, Sunday morning, that is part of the fulfillment here. And so, um, our ordained officers may have special roles in uh, Sunday morning. Um, and then uh, the important thing to get here is that this laying on of hands communicates um, them being set apart as holy for this work. Um, and so it's, it's a, it's a, it's a participation um, of, uh, of the people in this ritual whereby they are, they are entrusting, they're saying these they belong to us as part of the community, and we are we are giving them to God, um, and you know, and ex a, as holy to God, um, and also communicates the way in which they represent the whole people. Um, we are running short on time, but I just wanted to bring out one other aspect of this: who lays hands? Who lays on hands here? It's the whole congregation of the children of Israel. The whole people identify the Levites as their offering. I wanted to bring in this case specifically of Leviticus 4.15. The context in Leviticus 4 is that some kind of sin has been done by the whole community. Occasionally, you'll hear people claim that sin is a purely individual thing in the Bible and that we each repent of our own sins individually. And there's a certain measure of truth to that. Um, Certainly sin is something in the heart of an individual believer, and the Bible does expect it to be addressed in an individual way. However, the Bible also has an idea of communal sin and communal responsibility. So this is a sacrifice for um, when the community is sinned in some way, um, unintentional sin in this case. And um, Leviticus 4 provides for sacrifices to deal with the problem of unintentional sin. And what do we have is the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull before the Lord, and the bull shall be slaughtered before the Lord. So what I'm interested in here is primarily the fact that why is it just the elders who lay their hands? Well, if you think about it, even if you're thinking about the Levites and their situation, um, I don't know, maybe there were enough Levites for everybody in the people of Israel to be involved in laying a hand on you know, a Levite that was near to them. But in many cases, it wouldn't be practical to have the whole community laying their hands on. Uh, what's more, you have these leaders who are elders who represent the community. And so the bull is really a sacrifice offered on behalf of the whole community, but the elders represent the community in laying their hands on the bull. So here is the elders and not the whole people who lay their hands on the bull, but they're functioning representatively. In the elders, um, the whole people is symbolically um, laying hands upon the bull and saying, this is our, our sacrifice. We are giving this bull over to God to deal with our unintentional sin. Okay. Um, I, we're going to have to cut it off there. Um, 
uh, because we got to get to go to go to church. But that just outlines some of the Old Testament backgrounds. I'll be referring to it. We're going to get to New Testament passages about laying on of hands, but I wanted to lay that kind of background so we understand some of the symbolism, some of the ritual logic behind it, um, which will help us understand what's going on in the New Testament.